Thank you for joining us today for this life-changing message from River of Life. If you are ever in our area, we would love for you to join us. For more information, visit us at rolcrawfordville.com. That's rolcrawfordville.com. Or download our app in the App Store under ROL Crawfordville. Now, let's join Derek Gray as he teaches from the Word of God. If you're visiting with us, uh, welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study here at River of Life. We are, for the past year, uh, we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount, and we are almost done. Um, I was looking at it this week. I think we've got about four weeks left, maybe five uh, at the most, but uh, probably about four weeks left in this, this incredible sermon. And I hope, that, uh, I hope it's been as valuable to you guys as it has been to me. Um, we won't look too far ahead. We still got some verses to go. And tonight we're going to be in Matthew uh, chapter 7, verse 12. And uh, it's just a single verse, but it absolutely, without a doubt, deserves its own uh, lesson And as you can see, the title is The Golden Rule. So let's read the words of Jesus, Matthew 7, 12. He says this, So, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. So, obviously from the title, the verse in front of us tonight is what is commonly known as or or famously referred to as the golden rule. Now, you're not going to find the golden rule anywhere in the Bible. Uh, Jesus didn't call it that. You know, he didn't stand up and say, hey, let me give you all this rule here, and we're going to call it the golden rule. Uh, he didn't do that. That phrase was coined probably somewhere around the 15th or 16th centuries. Um, somebody decided to call it that, and it stuck, and uh, we've been calling it that for the last four or 500 years. Now, this verse is not complicated. Um, It's certainly impressive, Uh, it's powerful, Uh, it's challenging, it's a lot of things, but it's not complicated. Um, It says what it means, and it means what it says. So we've got a little bit of time tonight to look at a few other areas. So there's a couple things I want to talk about. The first thing that we want to discuss is the uniqueness of the golden rule. If you go out and you study This You can call it a rule or an ethic or a command or a teaching or whatever. If you go and you really study it, you'll find that no other religion, no other holy writings out there have anything that quite come to the the, the place of the golden rule. They're certainly not equal to the golden rule. Now, even as I say that, uh, if you go out and study it, you'll hear skeptics and and people who aren't religious, they will deny what I just said. They'll say, oh, no, no, no. Every, all religions have a golden rule. All religions, all holy writings uh, have some type of, 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 of this ethic. And they actually have a, a name for it. They call it the ethic of reciprocity. And so they say all religions have this, but uh, that's not the case. That's not the case. No other religion, no other holy writing uh, has anything like uh, the golden rule. So I thought I'd give you an example, uh, a few examples of tonight of things you find in other uh, writings of other religions, especially the Eastern religions. Uh, Confucianism says this, do not do to others what you would not want them to do to you. Uh, Hinduism says this, this is the sum of duty Do not do to others what would cause pain if done to you. Buddhism says this, hurt not others in ways that you yourself would find hurtful. So that's a, you can tell those are very similar to what Jesus is saying. Uh, Even in the Apocrypha, we find something very uh, similar. Now, if you're not familiar with the Apocrypha, let me give you a brief, uh, a brief explanation of what the Apocrypha is. Uh, there was a 400-year period between when the Old Testament ended and the New Testament began. 400 years is called the intertestamental period. And during that 400 years, there were several books that were, were written. And uh, the Catholic Bibles actually include those books, or the Catholics include those books in their Bible. They're called the Apocrypha. 
Protestants, for the most part, we don't, we don't have those books in our Bible. And there's three reasons why. Um, number one, if you go back to any copy of the Jewish scriptures, you never see any of those books. So you go back to the Septuagint or any, any Jewish scriptures never included those books. That's reason number one. Number two, nobody in the New Testament, Jesus, Peter, James, Paul, any of those guys, ever referred to those books or quoted from those books. So it was obvious they didn't consider them scripture. The third reason we don't include the Apocrypha is because there's things in them that don't line up with the breadth of Scripture. And tonight is a perfect example. One of those Apocryphal books is called Tobit. And in Tobit chapter 4 verse 15 it says this, And what you hate, do not do to anyone. Now listen, that lines up perfectly with Eastern religions. It lines up with Hinduism and Buddhism and Confucianism, but it does not rise to the level of what Jesus said. There's something different about what Jesus said, and we'll see that in just a moment. Now, all of those sayings from Hinduism and Buddhism and Confucianism and the Apocrypha, they're all similar to what Jesus said, but they're not, they're not the same. And the reason they're not the same, and one thing you'll note about them is they're all stated in the negative, and they involve passivity. Now, let me explain what I mean. What those, what those statements say is they tell you, consider what affects you negatively. What do you not like? What discourages you? What upsets you? What hurts you? What, uh, what angers you? Everybody with me? Think of it from the negative, And then whatever those things are, don't do that to other people. In other words, you, just, you don't have to do anything. Just don't do. Are you with me? You, you can be completely passive. Just don't do those things. So those statements are all coming from the negative, and they all just ref they don't require you to actually perform any action. You just have to not do certain things. In other words, let me give you some examples. You don't want people gossiping about you, then you don't gossip about them. You don't want people to steal from you, you don't steal from them. You don't want people to mistreat you, then don't mistreat them. You don't want people to condemn you, to judge you, then don't judge and condemn them, okay? It's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. Now, let me say this. There's nothing wrong with that, those statements. Are you with me? You certainly, it's, it's absolutely true that you should not do to other people things that you would not want them to do with you. There's nothing wrong with those statements. And, and certainly, that aspect of how we treat others is included in what Jesus says. In fact, many refer to those statements, many Christians refer to those statements as the silver rule. Don't do to others what you wouldn't want them to do to you. We call that the silver rule. Why? Because just as silver is not as valuable as gold, that statement isn't as valuable as what Jesus said. They're good statements, but they're not the best statement. They're a good rule, a good ethic, but they're not the best rule and the best ethic. And, and again, the reason for that is because that silver rule, don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you, it requires you to do absolutely nothing. In fact, you could be completely apathetic toward other people, and you could obey the silver rule. You don't have to love anybody. You don't have to show mercy to anybody. You don't have to be generous to anybody. You ain't got to do nothing. Just don't do those types of things. It's completely passive. Now, you see, here's what you need to understand about Confucianism and Hinduism and Buddhism and the Apocrypha. Those are all man-made religions. And man-made religions can only take you so far. And the highest they'll ever take you is to tell you to keep your sin in check. Just keep your negative behavior in check. That is the morality of man-made religion. Didn't we learn that from the scribes and the Pharisees? Isn't that what they thought? Just don't murder anybody. Just don't actually commit adultery with a woman. It doesn't matter who you are on the inside. It don't matter how full of hate or how full of lust. Just don't do the act and you're okay. See, that's the epitome of man-made religion. That's as high as it'll ever take you. That's, what, that's the silver rule. But Jesus doesn't stop there. His command, the golden rule, has a very subtle but very important difference that makes it so much greater and so much higher 
than those other religions. His command is positive, and his command is proactive. It's not enough to don't do what you wouldn't want others. He says it in a different way. He says, do unto others what you would want them to do to you. You want people to say kind things about you, then you say kind things about them. You want people to to help you, to assist you, to be generous to you when you're down, then you need to help and assist and be generous to them. You want people to lend to you, then you need to lend to them. You want people to assume the best about you, then you need to assume the best about other people. Basically, Jesus says this, when you come to a situation in your life, ask yourself the question, what would I want somebody to think about me in this situation or say about me in this situation or or do to me in this situation? And whatever your answer is, go do that thing. Does everybody see the difference between theirs and Jesus? Theirs is all negative and passive. His is like, nope, go do it. It's not enough to not do it. That's why Jesus is the golden rule. His is the gold standard. And is, by the way, it is much harder and much more demanding. Religion will always let you stop at not sinning. Jesus always says, no, you blow right past that and you go do something. You love them. That's the difference between Jesus and them. Now, I want to I delve into that statement a little bit. And I want to look at what Jesus doesn't say. I'm going to give you four things. Number one... He doesn't say whatever others have done for you, do for them. He doesn't say that. He says whatever you, say it with me, wish. Whatever some translations say, whatever you desire, whatever you want. See, the measure of what we do for others isn't what they've done for us. In fact, it's got nothing to do with them, what they've done. It's not limiting to that. It's what you'd want somebody to do. You literally ask the question, if I, you know, what would I want somebody to do, regardless of whether they've done it or not? What would I want somebody to do? What would I wish that somebody would do? Then you go do that thing. So it's not limited to what somebody does for you. We don't just reciprocate. We go beyond. Number two, he doesn't say the few things you wish others would do to you, do, do also to them. No, he says what? Whatever. I don't know how he could use a broader term than whatever. You can do anything you want. You can cut a neighbor's grass. You can have somebody over for dinner. Here's the cool thing about this command. The only limit of what you do for somebody is your imagination. That's the only limit. I read an article earlier this year. I was telling Pastor Henry about it, about a church in North Carolina that had an idea. And they went out and started a program. And let me read it for you. It says, uh, this church uh, for the congregation bought up $3.3 million of medical debt, setting free over 3,300 local families, and they did it with only $15,000 in donations. So there's an organization out there, and what you can do is partner with them, and they'll go out and negotiate medical debt down. So if, say, let's say a hospital, you owe them 100000 Well, they know they ain't going to get it, right? So this organization comes in and says, well, we'll give you 5000 And the hospital says, so. So. Now, isn't that a cool idea? Can you imagine 3,300 families plus under the burden of medical debt? And it's just gone. For $15,000, they bought up $3.3 medical, uh, $3.3 million. You think somebody might have asked a question, you know, what would I want somebody to do for me if I was burdened down by medical debt? You, you can do anything you want to do. It's not about what somebody else has done or what somebody else, some idea. Just think outside the box. Pastor Henry stood here on Sunday and and said there's greatness in all of us. And I believe that. And it's just a simple question. What would I want somebody to do? Number three, he doesn't say whatever you wish people like you would do to you, do also to them. He says whatever you wish that others, that's pretty much anybody in your life. That's the, the grumpy neighbor, the kid nobody likes. 
the, the lady at the, 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 the checkout, the, your mechanic, the, the people that don't like you. It's everybody. That encompasses everybody. And number four, and I almost didn't put this one in there, but I wanted to, it probably goes without saying, but I wanted to say it anyway. It doesn't say whatever you wish others to do to you, do also to them, period. There's not a period at the end of that. It says, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do to them, comma, for this is the law and the prophets. Now, why do I say that? Because it should go without saying that the golden rule still needs wisdom and discernment. You see, the judge that's standing there before a murder, the guy's been convicted of murder, the judge doesn't say, well, you know, what would I want somebody to do for me? Of course, the answer would be, well, let me go, right? But he can't do that because there's laws and there's justice. In the same way, we, we have to keep our, whatever we do, within the bounds of Scripture. Are you with me? It's the law and the prophets. So we don't step outside the bounds of Scripture with the golden rule. It, it really is an incredible statement. I, I want to give you a scenario. I, I want you to think for a moment. Let's just say somehow, some way, all the Bibles in this country were confiscated. They got everybody's Bible. There's none to be found. You can't buy one. You can't borrow one. They, they got them from every house. And somehow they scrubbed everything off the Internet. They scrubbed. You can't find anybody teaching Scripture on radio or the Internet or TV. There's no more podcasts. Uh, there, you just can't find any teaching anywhere. It's gone. And let's say some time even went by and you began to forget scriptures. You couldn't remember what certain scriptures said. Can I tell you this? Did you know if all of that really happened, you could still treat other people the way that Jesus wants you to by remembering one thing. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You don't have to remember 800 scriptures. You don't have to figure out every little situation and all that. Just ask that simple question and you can literally navigate your life and treat others. How incredible is that? In fact, here's the other thing that makes this incredible. You don't even have to know the other person. you got to know nothing about them. Because they don't have anything to do with them. What would I want somebody to do for me? Is the only question you have to ask. So you start with somebody that you know very well, which is, of course, your, yourself. I mean, think about this for a moment. All the, how many books in the world have been written on ethics, morality, relationships? How about marriage? How many books do you think are out there on marriage? Thousands upon thousands. Do you know you can boil it all down to one statement? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Do you understand how incredible that statement is? I mean, it's, it's really mind-blowing when you think about it that we could literally take all the relationship books in the world and boil it down to that statement. And we could, we could navigate our way through life like that. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, It is well described as the golden rule. What an extraordinary and remarkable statement it is. Now, I need to give you a warning, okay? I don't, know, I don't understand this, but, and I don't know another name for it. I call it fortune cookie morality, okay? Our world is awash in fortune cookie morality. Uh, you can go to Facebook. You can go to Instagram. You can go to the, anywhere on the Internet. You can go to, you go to people's offices, and it's on T-shirts. It's on coffee mugs. It's on posters on the wall. I don't know if y'all can read this. Things like... As we work to create light for others, we naturally light our own way. We rise by lifting others. They alone live who live for others. <laughs> fortune cookie, fortune cookie uh, morality. Here's why I bring this up. You see, the world loves the golden rule. They are, they are happy to take the golden rule and put it on a t-shirt or put it on a mug or put it on a poster. They have no problem with that at all. They love fortune cookie morality. The problem is, is they want to take God out of it. I can't tell you when I was studying this, I went out to, 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 to Reddit and looked at some of their forums about the golden rule and how many people out there, that, they're not even saved, they don't go to church, they're, they're, and they think, they say, well, I live by the golden rule. No, they don't. <laughs> 
It's impossible. They don't do that, but they, they like to pretend they do. They like to pretend they're moral people. As long as those morals are on a t-shirt, a coffee mug, or a, or, a, or a poster. The world is perfectly fine taking God out of the golden rule. And here's the thing. If I ask you tonight to quote the golden rule, most people would say something like this. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's how I learned it, right? Some of you may have learned it differently. Do you understand that's not all the verse says? That's not, what, that's not all that Jesus says. Let's read it again. This is the New King James Version. He says, therefore, comma, whatever you want men to do to you, do to them also, comma, for this is the law and the prophets. You see, God bookends the golden rule. He's in that word, therefore, and he's in that phrase, this is the law and the prophets. This is all about God. You see, that word, therefore, at the beginning, we all understand that, right? You say something, and then you say, therefore. In other words, in light of what I just said, therefore, go do this, or, or whatever the case may be. So what that word tells us is that the golden rule is not a detached statement. You can't just cut it out of the Bible and go put it on a t-shirt and say, hey, let's, let's live by that. It has a connection to something that came in front of it. Now, the question is, what connection to what? And, and, and we're not 100% sure, by the way. You get different answers. For example, one commentary I read or one pastor that I read tied it back to the verses that comes immediately in front of it, verses 7 through 11. You remember we studied this last week. Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened to you. And it goes on and talks about that, that God gives us the good things to those who, who love him. And, and this guy said, maybe it, what he's saying is because God is so generous to us, so generous to give us good things, that we should then go out in our life and lavishly give good things to others. And the way we do that is by asking that question, what would I want somebody to do to me? By the way, that preach is really good. And if somebody got up here next Sunday and preached it that way, I'd say amen, because there is nothing wrong with that. Martin Lloyd-Jones, in his book, Sermon on the Mount, ties it back to Matthew 7, 1 and 2, which we studied a few weeks ago. Judge not that you be not judged. And what he says is that if we're really going to walk through life not judging other people, the only way we can really do that is to ask ourselves in each situation, how would I want somebody to judge me? How would I want somebody to think about me? What would I want somebody to say about me? By the way, that also preaches really good. And if somebody got up here and said, that's, that's what he's talking about, I'd say, well, that sounds good. Amen. But I think it does mean both of those, but I think it means more. In fact... I think most probably he's, he, his therefore ties back to the, almost the entire body of his sermon. Now, we started this study September of, of, of last year, so we've been in it about a year. And I don't know if you remember all the way back in chapter 5 when Jesus begins to teach about righteousness. Do you remember he, he's going to start teaching about what the Old Testament really meant? What did, I, what did he really mean when he says do not murder? What, did he, what was the real spirit when it said do not commit adultery? He's going to begin to teach those things. And right before he does, in Matthew 5, 17, he says this. He says, don't think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. In other words, don't, don't think that I've come to do away with the Old Testament. No, he said, I have come to fulfill them. Now, I thought what I would do tonight is go look, what, what's he talking about? When he says the law and the prophets, what are some of these things in the Old Testament that he's talking about? Well, let's go read a few of them. So remember, he, he starts his teaching on righteousness by saying that he's not going to do away with the Old Testament commands. Instead, he's going to fulfill them. Now, what are some of these Old Testament commands? Let me give you a few of them. Here's one from Deuteronomy 22, 1 through 3. It says, you shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep going astray and ignore them. You shall take them back. 
And you shall do the same with his donkey or with his garment or with any lost thing of your brother's which he loses and you find it, you may not ignore it. So there's a command in the Old Testament that says if you find something that your brother or your neighbor lost, you got to take it back to him. Isn't that the golden rule? Isn't that just one situation that's covered under the golden rule? If I found a, a, a lost wallet or I found something like that, shouldn't I ask the question, what would I want somebody to do for me if I lost this wallet? And whatever the answer to that is, you go do that thing. How about uh, Exodus 23, 4 through 5? When you come upon your enemy's ox or donkey going astray, you shall bring it back. When you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under its burden and you would hold back from setting it free, you must help. Isn't that the golden rule? When you help others, doesn't matter if it's your neighbor, your brother, or your enemy. What would I want someone to do for me? How about Deuteronomy 5.21, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Leviticus 19.13, you not, shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. Leviticus 19.15, you shall do no injustice in court. Would I want somebody to covet my wife? Would I want somebody to oppress or rob me? Would I want somebody to lie about me in court? No, then you don't do those things. How about a couple more in Leviticus? You shall not be a slanderer among your people. You shall not hate your brother. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge. Would I want somebody slandering me? Would I want somebody hating me, bearing a grudge against me, taking vengeance? No. Then don't do those things either. I mean, you go to all these commands in the Old Testament, and they just fall right under, right under the golden rule. It's like he starts out, he says, don't think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. No, I've come to fulfill them. And then at the end, he says, therefore, therefore, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do to them, for this is the law and the prophets. It's like Jesus says, in light of all that we've been teaching for the past year, in light of all that we've learned about the, the, the spirit of the Old Testament and the truth of the Old Testament and what the Old Testament really meant, in light of all that, here's one rule. Follow this rule because it sums it all up. It really is an incredible, incredible statement. I mentioned earlier, Pastor Henry stood up here Sunday and he, he talked about great exploits. Y'all remember that? I thought I would give you an example tonight. And it involves the golden rule. By the beginning of the 1800s, about 3.1 million African slaves had been taken from their homes and their villages in Africa, transported across the Atlantic to the Americas, the Caribbean, uh, and only 2.7 million arrived, which means, by the way, 400,000 died. Uh, on the ships crossing the Atlantic. Now, there's a lot of reasons for slavery, a lot of reasons. But one thing you cannot deny is that it was a profoundly racial issue. Now, why do I say that? Because they ain't stealing people from Germany. They're not robbing people from Holland. They're not raiding villages in Australia. The only people who are being stolen from their homes and from their villages and being degraded and stripped of their dignity to serve as a slave for another human being, the only people that was happening to were black people. Now, how do you end an evil like that? How do you end an evil like that? Well, we know how we ended it here, right? We ended it here in a civil war. We ended it here with the cost of 750,000 men lying dead on the battlefield. Three quarters of a million people had to die to end it here. But it turns out that there's another story. Because there's another country that played a huge role. We, we often think about slavery and we immediately think about America. But there's another country that played a huge, huge role in slavery, and that was Great Britain. So you got to remember, in, by the time you get to the end of the 1800s, the 1790s, I mean, um, you, the, America's only been a country 20, 25 years. All the people in America were at one time British citizens. 
In fact, it was British ships that was raiding the homes and villages. It was British captains who were taking those ships and transporting those 3.1 million human beings back across to the colonies, both in North America, South America, and the, uh, and the Caribbean. And on to the scene comes a man, and his name is William Wilberforce. Now, this is a shame. Um, I never, in high school, I never heard of this guy. In college, nobody ever taught me about this guy in Western Civ and all those other classes. I, it wasn't until I was up into adulthood I'd ever even heard about him. So William Wilberforce is born in 1759, and he's, he's rich. He's born into a high-class family. He'll never have to worry about anything his entire life. He don't even know what he's going to do with his life. And he decides at the age of 21, well, I'll be a politician. So he runs for parliament, and he gets elected in 1780. And for five years, he does absolutely nothing. And by the way, those aren't my words. Those are his words. He said, my first years in par parliament, I did absolutely nothing. <laughs> nothing to any purpose. He was just there. But something happened to him in 1785 at the age of 26. He became a Christian. And he wasn't just one of these guys that became, said, well, I'm going to church, I'm a Christian. No, he became a Christian. Something changed on the inside of him. And two years later, at the age of 28, on October the 28th of 1787, he wrote this in his diary, 28-year-old. He says, God Almighty has set before me two great objects, the suppression of the slave trade and the reformation of morals. Can you imagine <laughs> He's 28, and he says, God has assigned me the exploit of ending the slave trade. Now, it, at Providence had this, God kind of works things out. When he was a boy, he lived with his grandmother and grandfather, and they went to a Methodist church, and the pastor of that Methodist church was a man by the name of John Newton. Now, if you don't know anything about John Newton, John Newton was a slave trader. He was one of the captains of the slave ships that transported people across the Atlantic. But John Newton got saved, and John Newton repented, and John Newton became a pastor. And when, when Wilbur Wilberforce was a boy, John Newton was his uh, pastor. And so when he gets saved, he goes and he reaches back out to John Newton, and John Newton becomes his mentor, his spiritual advisor. And men like Wilberforce and Newton and many other Christians in Great Britain became deeply persuaded that slavery was wrong and it absolutely had to end. Now, one of the reasons, and the reason I bring this story up tonight, is one of the reasons that they used for the ending of slavery was the golden rule. You see, they, all, they had preachers preaching sermons. John uh, Wilbur Wilberforce wasn't a preacher. He, just, he was like a congressman. But in every speech that he gave, he would always bring up the golden rule. For example, this one, he said this, Let everyone regulate his conduct by the golden rule of doing to others as in similar circumstances we would have them do to us, and the path of duty will be clear before him. So everywhere they went in their speeches, in their sermons, they, they tried to get people, rich people, poor people, everybody in between, to look at it from the slave's point of view. Don't just look at it from your point of view. Put yourself in, in their place. What would you want other people to do to you in that case? They kept bringing it up, kept bringing it up, kept bringing it up. One of the men, uh, was a, one of the pastors was a man by the name of Abraham Booth. And he preached a sermon on January 29th of 1792. And this is the name of the sermon. It was called Commerce in the Human Species and the Enslaving of Innocent Persons, Inimical to the Law of Moses and the Gospel of Christ. Now, that ain't no pigs and pearls. Okay? That ain't a, that ain't a catchy title like I had. But, man, did he preach. In fact, the interesting thing is you can still read it today. You can go online and read his sermon. And right there in sermon, he calls out the golden rule. What, what does Christ tell us to do? How can we treat fellow human beings this way when Christ says we're to treat them the way we want to be treated? He kept bringing it up and up. In fact, Matthew, uh, Michael Haken wrote a book, and he said this. Listen to this. 
One of the most moving parts of the message of that sermon was his imagining the slave ships landing on British shores, raiding cities like London and Liverpool and Bristol and kidnapping white people and dragging them away from their homes and their villages and families and taking them away never to be seen again. How would you feel? How do you want people to treat you? They just kept on and kept on. By the way, nobody, when they started, nobody wanted to listen. 20 years they pressed. 20 years they preached. And on February 24, 1807, the decisive vote was cast and the slave trade became illegal. Now here's the thing. It was called the Slave Trade Act of 1807. All it did was make slave trading illegal in the British Empire. You couldn't, you couldn't trade, but it didn't make slavery illegal. So they kept on, and they kept on for 26 more years. And on July 22nd of 1833, the Slavery Abolition Act passed the House of Commons unopposed. One week later, William Wilberforce died. One week later, he went home to be with the Lord. He said this, and I want you to listen to this. Life as we know it, with all its ups and downs, will soon be over. And we'll all give an account to God of how we lived. Listen, he didn't have nothing to be ashamed of when he walked through that door. And I know that he heard, well done, good and faithful servant. What about us? What about us? It'll soon be over. And every one of us is going to give an accounting of how we've lived our life. And listen, we may not be called to some great exploit like ending the slave trade. But let me tell you what we all are going to be called to account for. And that is every single one of us are called to live our life by the golden rule. It is the law and the prophets. It all falls under that. Treat others. Do unto others the way you'd have them do you. Now listen, we've spent this lesson praising the golden rule. And it is an unbelievable teaching. It's an unbelievable command. It's, it's, it's so simple, and yet you're only limited by your imagination. It's, it really is unbelievable. And everybody loves it. Everybody says it's praiseworthy. Everybody says it's marvelous and wonderful. But as Martin Lloyd-Jones says, the law is not meant to be praised. It's meant to be practiced. We got to make a decision. By the way, in just a couple weeks, we'll come to verses 24 and 26, and Jesus is going to lay it down. And this is what he says. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine, and we've been hearing them for a year, have we not? Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them is a fool. Is a fool who built his house on the sand. You see, there's two ways. There's a fork in the road that stands right in front of every one of us. Obey or not. Do or not. Follow him or not. But you can't just hear. It's not enough to hear. You have to obey. And here's the incredible thing to me. I, this is just so incredible to me. That what Jesus is telling us is I don't have to, I, I can walk out of here and say, God, I want to follow you because it is a high calling. But I don't have to be, uh, uh, I don't have to be a teacher of the word. I don't have to have gone to school to study Greek. I don't have to have uh, 700 passages of Scripture memorized. I just need one question. Just one question. What would I want others to do for me? It's a high calling, folks. Listen to uh, Ephesians 5.21. Therefore, say it with me, be imitators of God. That's what you're supposed to do as a Christian. Imitate God. That means, by the way, you love like God, and you forgive like God, and you show mercy like God. You talk like God, and you think like God, and as much as possible, you act like God. What, a, what an incredible high calling to, to, to walk that out, walk worthy of that calling. And Jesus says you can do it all just asking a question. Just asking a question. 
So I'll give you a few of these tonight. And, and by the way, how incredible that is, that you can do it by just asking simple questions. Let me give you some examples. What would you want others to do for you if you were in danger of hell? If you're in danger, if you were in danger of hell, what would you want somebody to do for you? Go do it. Go do it. Here's another one. What would you want others to do for you if you were burdened down by medical debt? Somebody asked that question, didn't they? And they went out and they made it happen. What would you want others to do to help you if you were lonely? Invite them over to eat. Spend some time with them. I, I, I'm just saying. The questions are really simple. How about this one? What would you want others to do to help you if your parents were disengaged? How many kids in this church, how many kids in our county and in our schools are, are living in a home with their parents that are completely disengaged? They're just following what they want. They're following their needs and their wants and their desires, and they're le leaving these kids to raise themselves. If you were in that boat, what would you want somebody to do for you? Would you want maybe somebody to step in and, and offer to be a mentor? To maybe take you fishing? Take you to a ball game? It ain't rocket science. What would you want others to do to help you if you were struggling with parenting your children? Do you guys understand that there are people... Listen, I was incredibly fortunate. I was raised by a mom and dad who who taught me how to be a dad, right? They, they modeled it for me every day. So by the time I got to the point where I had children, I knew how to do it as much as you can with all of your baggage that we got. I knew what to do. Do you know how many people, though, are being raised by parents that never model what it means to be a good dad or a good mom? And then they turn around one day and they have children and they don't know what to do. Nobody ever showed them. Nobody ever told them. Nobody ever modeled. What if that was you? What would you want somebody to do? Maybe step in alongside and hold your hand and say, hey, have you tried this? Or let me, let's pray about it. Are you with me? This isn't, this isn't theologically deep. It is an incredible, incredible teaching. One simple question that can be asked a myriad of ways and literally, it allows us to go out and do great things for God. It's absolutely incredible. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we love you. We thank you, as we always do, for your word. I am uh, I'm always astounded how powerful it is if we'll just read it and see it for what it is. And, but God, that's not enough. We need to walk it out. And I pray tonight that as we have heard this word, that I pray, God, in my life, in my family's life, and those close to me, that we will not just be hearers only, but we will be doers. That we will be willing to share our time and to share our home and, and, and to share the things that are ours, God, with others. Because that's what we would want them to do for us. God, help us all here at River of Life to walk that road, to be willing to ask these questions, to be willing to think outside of the box. Yes, it's going to cost us some time. Yes, it's going to take time and it's going to take effort. But God, we are called to be imitators of you. Thank you for making it pretty simple. <laughs> Thank you that it's just a question that we can ask. Lord, we love you. We thank you. And I give you glory ahead of time and I give you praise for what's going to happen in this church over the next weeks and months and years as people begin to walk out and really believe, take it to heart, and walk out the golden rule. We give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for watching our message from River of Life. If this message has touched you today, or if you need someone to pray with, please contact our office at 850 926 one two zero zero or email us at info at rolcrawfordville.com we also want to encourage you to visit us sunday mornings at 10 30 or wednesdays at 7 p.m 
please visit us at rolcrawfordville.com for more information and direction.